Hello and welcome to World Health Plus Social Good. I'm Vismita Gupta Smith and we're coming to you live from the 70th World Health Assembly here in Geneva, Switzerland. This year, it's a very special assembly because member states are going to elect the next Director General of WHO. This new Director General would replace Dr. Margaret Chan, who has served WHO for 10 years. So, while the voting goes on behind us, right behind us as we speak, we are going to take a look back at the last 10 years of public health. We're going to look at the challenges and milestones in public health. And you, must send us your questions. Don't forget to send us your questions on Facebook Live as well as on Twitter. Please use the hashtag WHA70 and hashtag social good. So joining, uh, joining me for the next 30 minutes to take a look in, at the past 10 years is Sir Liam. Sir Liam Donaldson, professor at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, previously the Chief Medical Officer of England and WHO Envoy for patient safety. Welcome, Sir Thank Liam. Thank you. Sir Liam, you have written a report uh, titled Healthier, Safer, Fairer. And that looks back at the challenges and achievements at the last, of the last 10 years. Let's talk about the healthier part of your report. How healthier are we? Could you quantify that for us, please? Well, looking back 10 years, 15 countries in the world had populations with average life expectancy of birth over 80 years. Almost a decade later, that figure has risen to 29 countries. And the biggest increases in life expectancy have actually been in Africa, one of the poorest parts of the world. We've also seen uh, big reductions in death rates for the big killers, HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis. And that's been because of a lot of good public health work, prevention, getting people access to medicines that can uh, stop them from dying. And for example, in the case of malaria, half of the cut in mortalities been down to those 900 million mosquito nets impregnated with insecticide that have gone out in Africa. And then there's the two measures that we care about most, deaths in childbirth, maternal mortality, and deaths in the under fives, dramatic reductions there. We do have to remember, though, that the poorer parts of the world and the richer parts of the world have very different health profiles. Those inequalities in health have to stay high on the agenda for the future, but an overall pattern of improving health, which is very encouraging. Now, those are really impressive numbers, but let's stay with, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, mothers, uh, about women living through their pregnancy and childbirth and children making it to, the, uh, to their fifth birthday. More and more children are making it uh, to the fifth birthday. That's quite a big achievement, isn't it? It certainly is, and it's, it's a mixture of improvements in social and economic development and technical measures like vaccine, treating diarrheal disease which causes a lot of deaths. So as ever in public health, no single factor is the answer, but if you get all of those factors, people working together right across societies, then you do start to see a big impact. Well, joining us now is Dr. Flavia Bustreo. Welcome. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how, what have been the biggest contributors to uh, this very remarkable success of reduction in maternal and uh, child deaths? So when we did the, what we call a success factor studies that was analyzing the success and the progress on the 10 countries that had achieved the Millennium Development Goal 4 of reduction of child mortality and 5 of reduction of maternal mortality, we saw that approximately 50% of that reduction was attributable to investments outside the health sector. For example, education of women was a key important factor. Um, investment in the transport, in the infrastructure, in the ability of women particularly to have power to manage their household, microcredit investment and that kind. For what the remaining 50% that were the investment in the health sector, it was very clear that the coverage of certain interventions was very critical and very important. In particular, immunization, 
because during the period of the Millennium Development Goals, there were new vaccines that were introduced that were against the main killers. For example, the vaccine against pneumococcal pneumonia, the vaccine against rotavirus, uh, uh, one of the major killers against diarrhea. But it wasn't just the vaccines, it was also an increased coverage in access to the essential intervention, such as antenatal care, for women and particularly for maternal mortality, increase access to delivery within healthcare facility assisted by a knowledgeable healthcare worker that can recognize if there are complications, obstruction to the delivery and can, can provide the care that is necessary in case of an emergency, either a cesarean section or, for example, assistance after a, a bleeding, an important bleeding after the delivery. That's interesting, isn't it, that so much of this, about 50%, like you said, of this uh, impact actually lies outside the control of health sector, but then 50% of it has been our, uh, the work that has been done uh, in the health sector. Let's talk a little bit about the role that uh, political will plays in all of this. I think it uh, plays a very big part and one of the things I've found in the work that I've done on global health is it isn't just political commitment from the top, you have to have that from presidents and prime ministers, but it's the alignment of that political power, getting it aligned from the national level to the regional or state level and then right down to the local officials and ideally also the community leaders who may not be part of the formal uh, uh, pol political system. That alignment and flow of political power is the thing that makes the big difference. Flavio? Maybe if I can add, it's also an important thing to say, for maternal mortality, we did not see any movement in the overall number of deaths from 1990 until 2010. 2010. The, we always had, every year, around 500,000 maternal deaths. In 2010, there was an unprecedented movement and political commitment that, as Professor said, encompassed a number of leaders, for example, the G8 at that point, they launched an initiative called Muskoka Initiative for Maternal, Newborn and Child Mortality with more than $10 billion. Also, the Global Strategy for Women and Children's Health was launched by the UN Secretary General. And there were commitments of more than 40 billion, including from the country themselves, with the highest maternal and child mortality rates. So seeing that sudden and inclusive movement of political will was what we then started seeing the decrease of maternal deaths. And I want to quote one aspect, particularly on maternal deaths, by a former political leader, Prime Minister Stoltenberg of Norway. He said, if maternal deaths were not happening among women, but they were deaths in men, the political will would have been faster. I.e., there is an important aspect, I have to tell you, you asked me the 50%, one clear correlation was the composition of the parliament and what proportion of women parliamentarians were present. For example, one of the countries with the steepest decline was Rwanda, where in fact the composition of members of parliament is the highest proportion of female parliamentarians. Sir Liam, is that yeah, your I couldn't ag too? agree more and I think one of the big trends right across global health, all areas of global health in the last decade, has been the much greater involvement and empowerment of women and especially down in communities, women coming into play in the delivery of service, the planning of services and I think that's something that we really have to make sure that it grows even more in the future. Well, I want to take some audience questions. Uh, to asking audience questions is Pinky Patel from UN Foundation. Thank, Thank you. you, Pinky. We have viewers from over 30 countries who are tuning in live and are excited about this conversation. One question in particular from Renu in Nepal asks or wants to know how the public health infrastructure differs around the world and how that contributes to the gap between developed countries and developing countries and how do we continue working forward to close that gap and ensure equality? So it's important to note that when we talk about infrastructure in health, we don't just mean physical infrastructure. The infrastructure that is very important, particularly for reduction of maternal and child deaths, 
is especially at the community level and as uh, the professor has highlighted, particularly we have seen in many countries of the world where when community, especially community uh, healthcare workers and particularly women, when they are empowered with the knowledge to accompany women during their pregnancy, accompany them during the time of delivery, that's very, very important. So it's not so important only the physical infrastructure, it's the human capital, the healthcare workers and the community workers that are very, very important. And in that respect, Across the globe, there are countries, for example, like Sri Lanka, that have been able to achieve impressive reduction of maternal deaths without having physical infrastructure that is so highly developed. I'm going to go to Pinky for one more question. We have a question, an interesting question, about how WHO works to ensure that solutions are inclusive and adapted to a community's cultural context. Shall I take it? Yes, please. <laughs> so let me answer with a real life experience that I had when I was working for the World Health Organization in Sudan uh, in combating female genital mutilation. That's uh, an aspect of our work that is uh, very important uh, to have cultural sensitivity. So we do not work directly. Uh, imposing norms that are coming from the outside, but what we do, we work with the professional associations, there were uh, pediatricians and gynecologists that were very interested in this topic and were working, civil society organization, also with religious leaders organization, and we just empower them with the knowledge and the data and what was possible to do. That's the way that WGO works on these very sensitive topics. Thank you, uh, Flavia, for joining us. Uh, Salim, I wanted to talk about uh, one, another health topic that has now taken forefront, uh, is now at the forefront, and that's not communicable diseases, heart disease, diabetes, um, cardiovascular diseases, and diseases of the upper uh, respirate, of the respiratory tract. Um, these diseases rich countries, uh, but that's not so anymore. What has changed? Well, indeed, they, they used to be called the epidemics of um, civilization. Um, as the infectious diseases became less prominent, then people started to die of cancer and heart disease and stroke, as you say. And today, uh, it's not so much the death rates, although people do die prematurely from mm -hmm. these diseases, it's the extent to which they live with the burden of those diseases, like diabetes, for example, which can potentially uh, affect the quality of life as well as the length of life. And um, the latest data show that actually, contrary to popular belief, 80% of the burden, 80% of the burden of these non-communicable diseases are actually in low and middle income countries. And as they become established in those countries, then they tend to concentrate in the poorer neighborhoods and communities. So in some ways, those countries have a double burden. They have the burden of the infectious diseases and the tuberculosis and the AIDS and the malaria, but then they also have the largest burden of the non-communicable diseases. Now, that's quite a challenge, isn't it? That uh, the economically weaker sections of our populations are now also dealing with diseases that will need long-term care uh, and, and uh, treatment. How are countries dealing with this? Well, it's, it's at one level you can point to the factors to do with living which mm. make uh, people suffer from these diseases. So common factors like tobacco smoking, mm. um, not taking enough exercise, uh, an unhealthy diet, um, misuse of alcohol, all of those things are what are called the risk factors. Mm. But then underlying that are the circumstances that yeah. cause people uh, to be to undertake those um, lifestyles. And that's sometimes call, uh, called by the experts the causes of the causes. Mm. And those are the social and economic de determinants of health, the, uh, the poverty, the lack of educational opportunities for mm. children. And so when people talk about trying to tackle the non-communicable diseases, they do look at things like sugar taxes, um, taking smoking advertising away, 
uh, stopping smoking in public places, but then they also think about the education, particularly in the early years, where we need to build not just knowledge about health, but healthy values so that children grow up to regard uh, the health of their body as a fundamental value. Now, we'll talk a little bit more later in the week on, in, on Thursday and Friday's shows about non-communicable diseases and the role that WHO and partner agencies are playing in helping countries combat them. But I want to now move on to uh, healthy aging. Um, as people are living longer, what, about, what are we doing to maintain quality of life? Well, I'm in my 60s, mm. and I grew up in the 60s, and I can remember one of the first pop songs I heard. Uh, I'll admit to hearing it, but not dancing to it. <laughs> I, uh, it was called um, My Generation, and it was by a group called The Who. You, some of the grandparents listening might remember it. And there was a line in it which is, I hope I die before I get old. And that was a stereotype of old age, something to be feared, almost a revulsion. And, um, Sometimes when we talk about old age today, we still talk about it as a burden on societies, a burden on healthcare systems, a cost that we can't cope with. And all right, um, older people do suffer from many diseases and um, frailty. But on the other hand, there is a different vision of aging. And this is something that the WHO, in my view, one of the most important things that they've done over the last 10 years is to give that healthy uh, view of aging. We are not dying before we get old, we are living longer and we have to make sure that those healthy years of life, those years, extra years of life are spent in health and that means a very fundamental approach to trying to um, support, create the environments in cities and make sure that older people can fulfill those years of lives and are not regarded as a burden on society. You're absolutely right. My mother's 80 years old, and as she is aging, she wants to live healthier. That's one of her concerns, is that she wants to maintain her independence, to live healthier as she ages. And uh, that, that seems to be the challenge with our environments and for the countries, as well as for our communities. Yes, and we mustn't underestimate the problems of, of caring and supporting for older pe people. But, but it, Old age is very diverse now, not just within countries, but also looking across the world. Older people are very different in what they want out of life. Some very family orientated, others want to carry on working, others artists, entrepreneurs, innovators. And we have to let them and empower them to do what they want to do with those extra years of life, which bodies like the WHO and others working together across the world have actually given to them. Now, um, uh, Sir Liam, as all countries are working towards the sustainable development goals, for instance, one of the things that, one of the key goals has become universal health coverage. Um, but it's not a very well understood uh, term by the common uh, man. Um, so I want, to, I want to move our discussions to universal health coverage here. Joining us uh, to talk about is, is, it is Dr. Mary Paul Keeney, Assistant Director General for, he for Health Systems and Innovation. Thank you for joining us, Mary Paul. A pleasure. So, how do, could you please decode uh, universal health coverage? What is it, and maybe more importantly, what it isn't? Well, universal health coverage is when, when all people and communities, it's not only about personal uh, health, but people health and community have access to the health services that they need without the risk of financial ruin because of that. Mm. So, it doesn't mean that everybody should have everything. It is restricted to what you actually need in order to, um, to remain healthy. And it is about having this of a good quality to be able to, uh, to live a healthy life uh, and, and also have well-being in, in your life. It's a question about having intervention for health promotion. So this is services to help you stop smoking or stop drinking if it's necessary. Prevent it's about services for prevention of disease, like immunization if you are a child. Mm -hmm. 
It is about treatment. If you, if you are sick, you get the quality medicines you need. It is also about rehabilitation. If I need a wheelchair, can I get a wheelchair? And at the end, it's also about palliative care. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I um, have a dignified life when I don't need to suffer? No, just, uh, just as you explained, it's not one formula that would fit every situation and every country, and different countries are taking different routes to it. What are some of the best uh, routes to universal health coverage? Well, what we see is that all countries, uh, regardless of their uh, level of economic development, can start. Okay? So at the beginning, of course, if you start, you need to start with a small package. And most countries will, will first start to cover the needs of the children, the small children and, and their mothers, mm -hmm. mother and child health. But this then should be accessible to all the population and not only to the rich. So how can this be achieved? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you have a wealthy people who can pay for themselves. You have the employed people on which uh, an insurance scheme uh, which is associated with their employment, can finance the, the health services, but the government have a primary responsibility to take resp to care and to provide uh, coverage, financial coverage for the poor to start with and then the, the nearly poor. So this is for you know, the, the ones who are starting on that. Then, of course, the, the countries who are, uh, have universal health, health coverage and have had for decades sometimes are struggling also. They are struggling because medicines, health technology are becoming more and more expensive. So how can they, especially if there's a financial crisis, mm -hmm. keep on uh, having their, uh, their population on universal health coverage? So this is why it's very important to have discussion on how the health system can be transformed so that it's more efficient in order to, to keep services for everybody, even in rich countries. So let's talk about some of the challenges to universal health coverage that you are seeing on the ground and how countries are dealing with them. Well, one of the areas that I think the WHO should be proudest of is its record in trying to give greater prominence to the safety of care. Mm -hmm. And this journey started 10 years ago when the WHO noticed that other high-risk industries, for example, the airline industry, were improving their safety year on year on year. Mm -hmm and um, healthcare around the world has not done that to the same extent. It needed to learn as much as it could from the errors and mistakes that happened in other industries. So the WHO launched its global program, firstly with a challenge called Clean Care is Safer Care, to try and reduce the risks of infections that people catch while they're in hospital. Because if you look at one problem around the world which affects all healthcare systems is that too many people get infections that are avoidable mm. and we know that the best places keep that to a minimum mm -hmm. and so achieving the best everywhere was the purpose of this challenge. Well I want to come to you Mary Paul about a little more about challenges before we take some questions from our audiences. Yes you know it, it is absolutely striking to know as uh, Sir Liam just said that you know so many people get harmed when seeking care. Uh, so the, the global figure is a mean of one person out of ten who is better, who is worse off after having been in hospital than, than in, when entering the hospital. So that, that's really scandalous. Uh, as you know, the, the primary responsibility of healthcare is do no harm. Mm. So it is very important to look at, at safety. And safety is part of quality. You cannot mm. have quality services, quality care, right. without that being self right. safe. So this is very important. I think we need to continue to work on that. Uh, with countries, there's a lot of momentum, especially nosocomial infections, so which are the infections that people get at hospital, are getting under the limelight because mm. of uh, increasing antibiotic resistance that we see. Mm. So if we want to fight antibiotic resistance, one of the easiest in practice, in, 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 you know, in theory, uh, things to do is to go against unsafe care and make sure that, uh, that actually there are no more nosocomial infection. We're going to come back to uh, patient safety in a minute. Let me take a question from our audience, Pinky. Yes, yeah, so we have a question from Prabhu who wants to know how do we create public health programs that are more efficient, inclusive, and data-driven to achieve UHC as well as ensure patient safety? 
Well, it is, it is clear that in order to improve health services, you, you first need to know where you start from. So there are many issues about that. First, being sure of what are the main health problems in your population. For this, you need to know what people are, are dying from, you know, what's the main cause of mortality. And unfortunately, we have the system of registration of, of death and cause of death, which is still in many countries at a very, very low level. But we have made progress in the sense that now 50% of the death are now recorded with a cause of death, so making progress there. Then you need to have data, how much to spend? Uh, is the money well spent? How, man, uh, how many health workers do you have? Are, are they em employed in the, in the right position? Do they do the right things? A as you know, there's lots of discussion about uh, ghost health workers. These people who don't exist, mm. who are paid every, mo every mm. month. So in order to, to move towards efficient and cost-effective services, there is a need for data, reliable data all along in order for the, the governments to be able to, uh, to use their resources uh, properly, effectively, in order to increase the health and well-being of their population. Thank you very much, Dr. Mary Paul Kinney, for joining us today. Sir Liam, uh, as we were just discussing, uh, that patients, when they come into the hospital, they expect to get well and not sicker. Um, tell us a little bit more about uh, the program, the patient safety program. Well, there are two particular um, aspects which I think have been very successful over the last 10 years. So the first one was a, a very big campaign to make hand hygiene better in hospitals. I think when we first started to look at the figures, uh, people were shocked that um, something like 30, 40 percent of doctors and nurses only washed their hands before coming to touch a patient. Mm. When we started to look at the reasons for that, we found that it was quite difficult because in a busy hospital, um, a doctor or nurse may be visiting 30 patients in a morning and having to go and find a sink mm. each time to wash their hands with soap and water mm. was very difficult. It stops the flow of work. And in some of the um, poorer parts of the world, the hospitals don't actually have clean running water. So the magic solution to that was the introduction of the alcohol hand rub, something that uh, a doctor or a nurse could have on their, in their mm. pocket mm. or on the end of the bedside where you could ask visitors, relatives who were coming in to use it so that everybody had clean hands. And we know that a lot of the infection risks are associated with germs being transferred from somebody's hands to the patient. So that hand hygiene campaign now covers nearly 90% of the world's population. We got health ministers to sign a pledge and they committed themselves to reducing healthcare infection in their countries. The second innovation was, I mentioned the airline industry earlier, one of the things that pilots do before they take off every time mm. is to go through a checklist mm. to make sure that the plane is safe to fly. Now that uh, we now do in hospitals around the world before any patient has an operation. There is a WHO surgical checklist to make that operation safer for the patient. So that's been a, a, a long uh, decades of work in keeping our patients safe. Uh, but as we look back in the, at the past decade, uh, let's now move to diseases that we are now hoping to eradicate soon, polio, for instance. Um, Tell us, um, we've, had a, we've come really close now. We've never been closer uh, to eradicating polio. So tell us about the progress so far. Well, this has been one of the more prominent goals in global health over the last 10 years. It started in the 1980s when the World Health Assembly, backing a, a, a resolution that was promoted by Rotary International, had... Uh, called for polio to be eradicated. At that time, nearly half a million cases. We're now down to five in the entire world. But this stage of the eradication effort is the most difficult. The polio virus is fighting for its survival, and it's fighting very hard. It's finding the places where children are inaccessible because of uh, areas of conflict where populations can't flow. It's finding children in mobile populations who haven't been in one place to have the vaccine. 
and it's finding the places where the teams are working inefficiently. And the success of the program is absolutely one of the stars of the global health uh, history books. But this last stage is going to be a formidable challenge. Even with just five cases left, there are many infections out there that are not showing up as, uh, as cases in children, and they have got to be stamped out in the environment. But I'm very optimistic. Smallpox was the first disease to be eradicated, and I'm very uh, optimistic that very soon polio will be the second and guinea worm is also a disease that many, not many people talk about but the world is very close to eradicating that as well. So I want to now move to a really important part of our work and that's our work in health emergencies. Um, so um, as our uh, next guest joins us, uh, tell us a little bit uh, about the work in health emergencies by partners and WHO and how that has progressed. Well, in a way, I'm glad we've come to this last mm. because it's very, very important. But uh, when people hear about the World Health Organization, they often only hear about the emergencies. And that role is vitally important. But we have had the chance to tell people that the WHO's role is very broad and it's done all of these great initiatives to improve health in many other areas. But when we come to emergencies, I think it's about uh, being... Uh, really uh, learning every lesson that's possible from the emergency that went before so that the next time an emergency comes, the WHO and all the partners it works with is even better at dealing with it. And we have our next guest with us, Dr. Rick Brennan, Director Emergency Operations at WHO. Welcome, Rick. Thanks very much. Rick, Good take us through uh, what is the role that WHO plays in protecting health in emergencies? Well, I work on the operation side, the, the emergency response side, but um, perhaps the most important work that WHO does in relation to emergencies happens before emergencies occur. So we're very much involved in preventing emergencies and detecting emergencies uh, as they're evolving. So a lot of that prevention work is uh, undertaken together with our member states, the countries that make up WHO, as well as our partners, to build the capacities of countries to prevent emergencies from all types of hazards or, uh, or to mitigate them, whether they be infect uh, infectious disease outbreaks, whether they be natural disasters, technological disasters, and even uh, uh, civil unrest and conflict. We also play an important role in detecting emergencies early so that response can be rapid before they escalate. That's particularly important for potential outbreaks. Um, so we have a system of what we call global event-based surveillance. We have a team here in headquarters working with all our regional offices and our partners around the world, and they're tracking events, either through media, through contacts in ministries of health, through partners in, in, in countries, to detect when there may be uh, a cluster of cases of a disease that needs investigation. And then we work with our partners to make sure that that event is then appropriately investigated to determine whether it may be a risk to public health or not. And then if we determine that it might uh, constitute a risk to public health, we'll do what's called a risk assessment and then can initiate a response. As I mentioned, I work on the response side um, and we respond again to emergencies from a broad range of, uh, of hazards. Uh, recently, the yellow fever outbreak in Brazil, the conflicts in the Middle East, uh, natural disasters, for example, an earthquake in Ecuador recently, uh, chemical events in, in Syria and Iraq recently. Uh, and WHO has an important role in leading and coordinating the international response when emergencies occur, uh, providing important um, uh, up-to-date information on the ev evolution of the emergency, providing critical technical assistance, as well as direct services to uh, affected populations. Now, Rick, uh, WHO came under a lot of criticism uh, for the Ebola response uh, in 2014-15. What has changed now? What, did you, what was the difference that you see in, for instance, the current uh, Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo? I think the, the most important change at the organization is an acceptance and a realization that WHO has to pl play a really leading role in emergency operations and, and um, emergency management across the board. 
And to that end, following the, the outbreak, there were a series of evaluations of our performance and a lot of recommendations made. So we've undertaken a, a major restructuring of our emergency program um, that, uh, that is, very, I think, well designed. Uh, it's designed to really address all aspects of emergency management. Uh, and again, gives us the capacity to address emergencies from all the causes that I mentioned. Um, we have, uh, and so that's required restructuring at our headquarters uh, uh, level, but also in our regional offices and most importantly at country offices. At the same time, we have uh, updated our processes and systems to make sure that we're more efficient, more predictable, more effective, um, and strengthening our partnerships. No one agency can do any of this by itself. We have to work very, very, very strongly with our partnerships, and we're spending a lot of time strengthening those partnership networks. Um, one very important development has been, the develop has been the establishment of what we call our contingency fund for emergencies. It gives us financial flexibility so we can uh, react quickly, and, and that's an asset that we didn't have previously, and it made us slower. But, but now I, I think you're seeing a more effective and predictable response by the organization these days. I want to go to our audience questions now, Pinky. We have a lot of excited, excited viewers who are asking a lot of questions about how you deal with mental health issues, as well as a question from the International Federation for Spina Bifida and Hy Hydrocephalus, who's asking, how can we make sure that we take care of children and adults with disabilities during an emergency as well? So on the issue of mental health, um, mental health can, uh, problems can arise in, in emergencies from all causes. And it's absolutely vital um, that it's addressed early on. Most uh, mental health problems arise from people trying to deal with a really exceptional circumstance. Um, most people don't decompensate. Um, most of these are most of these are, uh, these problems arise from the unusual circumstances and can be dealt with through what we call psychosocial services, helping people in a very difficult situation to normalize their lives, get control over their lives, get access to assistance. Uh, simple measures like reunifying families who may be separated during an emergency, uh, making sure that children have something constructive to do. Uh, so many of our partners will establish child-friendly spaces and so on. So we don't need counselors coming in or you know, a psychiatric approach in most instances. Mostly it's about what we do, what we call providing um, psychological first aid and helping people normalize their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, we haven't said much so far about the role of the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations in global health. And I think in the emergency field, they've got a terrific track record and um, they do some brilliant work in difficult circumstances. And I know that the, uh, the new plans are aimed at um, coordinating very closely with the work that they do. And um, I'd just like to pay tribute to them because I think they do a fantastic job. No question. Uh, yeah. And uh, they're our closest partners, our NGO partners in the Red Cross movement. Um, and WHO is we're the, the cluster lead agency for the Global Health Cluster. Mm. And um, the Global Health Cluster represents a network of at country level, over hundreds of, of operational partners, most of whom are NGOs, local NGOs, international NGOs, and that they really are on the front line. The NGOs provide 80% of the assistance in, in emergencies. And the Red Cross movement too is, of course, absolutely vital. Well, I'm afraid we're running out of time, but I will let you have the last word, Sir Liam. As the election process goes on behind us uh, in the hall here, what are the, what are the challenges for the new Director General as they come in? What will be the role that they will be expected to play? Well, I think the, the most difficult uh, part of a job like this in a very complex, fast-moving world with many priorities is to stay focused and concentrate on the priorities and make sure they're dealt with. And I think in the course of producing this report, I've been deeply impressed by the very important foundational policies that the WHO has established. The healthy aging 
the social and economic determinants of health, the universal health coverage, the policies on disability. Those will shape the future, the future of healthcare and the future health of populations. And the new Director General needs to steer those and land them in the future in a way which will produce a much healthier world. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That's all we have time for today. So until next, until Thursday then, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.